Hey everybody, what's up? Jesus rules. Amen. Get my praise on. <laughs> anyway, welcome everybody again to another edition of Conrad Rocks for Jesus on ConradRocks.net. It's going to be a podcast. Um, check it out. Check Go over to my blog. It's lots of fun. There's lots of stuff over there. Basically, revelations that I receive from the Lord I'll share quite often here. And you know what? I do have an inner circle... Uh, Inner Circle podcast or Inner Circle newsletter that you might want to you might want to check it out. It only goes to my email subscribers, so go over there and look in the side bear, sidebar. My tang's tangled up and uh, sign up. And if you do, you're going to get a special Hearing God podcast um, that only I send to my email subscribers. It's pretty cool. You're going to get that right off the bat. It's a double opt in, so make sure that you check your email because you're going to have to do that click on the link inside the email before you're actually subscribed to conradrocks.net anyway today i got something i received from prayer uh, during a prayer walk today i wanted to quickly upload it and share it with you it's about the christian doldrums christian doldrums you know when i talk about christian doldrums i'm kind of tired of not seeing seeming things to go anywhere i mean i'm at where i'm at you know things things are going good it's just i i just i have a higher expectation you know some of my business plans have fallen through and you know some of the plans that i was counting on (laughs) you know and i was just complaining to the lord about it and i was i was asking the lord i'm like and then i started reflecting i'm like what what did i do wrong what could I have done to prevent this future that I was expecting? And this was a complaining prayer. You know, you know, the complaining prayers, I I started going, Oh my gosh, Lord, it seems like I only pray when I'm complaining. I was thinking about that. And then the Lord interrupts and he says, the just shall live by faith. And I knew it was him too. It was, I mean, I knew it. I was dialed in. Yeah, and I immediately knew. You know how the Lord downloads things to your spirit? Just bypassing all that reasoning that goes on, that, you know, the fight, the carnal logic that fights God. It just bypassed all that, went straight to my heart. I was frustrated, you know, and, and then I realized that I was putting the spiritual cart before the spiritual horse. Again, time after time, I have made the blunder of waiting for income before you do ministry. Now, I don't I don't mean all ministry. I mean, I have my blogs. I do a lot on Google+, Twitter, and other social media. But basically, you know, a lot of us make that mistake. And the Bible says, you know, if you got the Spirit of God in you, yo, money's really kind of a... You can't serve God and money. You know, Acts 3, 6. Peter says, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have I give to thee. In the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Didn't take no money to heal that man. Took the Spirit of God. Peter was so anointed with the Spirit that he'd walk down the street and his shadow would heal people. Matthew 10, 8 through 10. Jesus is instructing his disciples, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, Freely you have received, freely give. Provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor script for your journey, neither two coats, neither shoes, nor yet stays. For the workman is worthy of his meat. Now I'd like to point out as an interjection here that Jesus told them to do this. He gave them a commandment. He gave them a word. Keep that in mind. James 2 5. It's another verse that comes to mind. Hearken, my beloved brethren, hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom which he hath promised to them that love him? That'll put a damper on the current teachings of the prosperity doctrine. So during this revelation I was receiving in prayer, my prayer turned from one of complaining into one of expectation because I know 
I knew the Lord was going to give me something. I was dialed in. I was in the spirit on this prayer walk today. He's up to something. And I knew that he was about to shed some light on my frustration. You know, God lets us go through the frustration, and then he talks to us about it. You ever notice that? And I knew at that moment that my prayer was not bouncing off of a heaven of brass. I knew I was getting through. I knew the Lord was communing, and I knew he was in the mood to talk. Or on retrospect, maybe I was in the mood to listen. So the phrase, as I was listening, the phrase Christian doldrums, Christian doldrums came into my spirit. Now I've known, I know what the doldrums were, or I thought I knew, but I wanted to look it up for my own edification after I took my notes and stuff, and for the edifications of my listeners. Now here's the Wikipedia definition. It's quite interesting, because it's not exactly what I was expecting. Quote, The doldrums is a colloquial expression derived from historical maritime usage for those parts of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean affected by the intratropical convergence zone, a low-pressure area around the equator where the prevailing winds are calm. The low pressure is caused by the heat at the equator, which makes the air rise and travel north and south high in the atmosphere until it subsides again in the horse latitudes. Some of that air returns to the doldrums through the trade winds. This process can lead to light or variable winds in more severe weather in the form of squalls, thunderstorms, and hurricanes. The doldrums are also noted for calm periods when the winds disappear altogether, trapping sail-powered boats for periods of days or weeks. Unquote. Now I want to repeat that last sentence because I know some of us feel like that now. The doldrums are also noted for calm periods when the winds disappear altogether, trapping, trapping sail-powered boats for periods of days or weeks. Now, I've been looking for some wind in my sails. As I was contemplating this during prayer, it was like God was giving me scripture. You know how that works, right? John 3, 8, the wind bloweth. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest in the sound thereof, but canst not tell where it cometh and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. You know, I was look, I'm looking for a spiritual wind to fuel my sailboat, to go in the direction of the compass heading that Christ wants me to go. And I realize that I'm in a Christian doldrum myself. Are you? Now, my doldrum is when I find that there's, there's not a spiritual driving force in my life that overshadows everything else. All my carnal reasoning, everything else, I know that I know that I know in my knower that I have a word from God and the spirit of faith to fuel me on. When I'm in a doldrum, I feel that I've been beat down by the world. The problems seem insurmountable. The world and its problems seem to want to quench the spirit to where there's no wind in my sail at all. And I'm just stuck in a doldrum. And until I know, until we as Christians know how to overcome this, we might not be looking at the storm or taking our eyes off of Jesus as Peter did, but we may just experience these things. We might experience apathy. Who cares? Laziness and hopelessness. Now, I may be, I may be able to see the compass heading, but I'm just not invigorated or inspired or have that faith, that spirit of faith to get me back moving. Things start to pile up. You know, if you don't, if you don't do what I'm about to talk about, it just kind of stays the same. You're trapped for weeks sometimes. Let me tell you about a pitfall of being in a Christian doldrum. A person might begin to question things. Did God really tell me that? And we all know that the first question in the Bible is, hath God said? And we know who said it. It was the devil. Well, I may surprise you. I may say that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say that this is a good thing and a bad thing. The reason I say it can be good, it can be good to question things, is that it gives you time to reflect and to see if, in fact, were you in communication with God? Or did you try to go about and do God's will in the flesh 
without a commandment. Like Abraham, you know, he had a word from God. I mean, they had to work this through, but he was working it through carnally, and they had, they had Ishmael, remember? They started reasoning among themselves. You know, things like this can happen if you don't really take the time to reflect if you're hearing from God. And Christians hear from God. I don't care what the world says. The world calls you crazy if you hear from the Lord. But the Bible commands it. Now, it can be bad because then you begin to doubt what God has actually told you. And then you begin to not follow through with obtaining the promise or possessing the promised land. That spiritual wind of faith just isn't there to blast you through those mental obstacles. Now, another pitfall is you may begin or continue doing something just because you're, you know, you just say, well, this is a godly type thing to do, and you just may go do something in the flesh. You know, it may fall under the category of ministry, but it isn't God's perfect will for your life. Romans 12, 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what's that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, we need to renew our minds that we may prove. What do you do when you prove? You test it. What is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? There's three different wills here. Good and acceptable can be enemies of the perfect will of God for your life. I heard that in Words of Wisdom podcast, which you should check out. As I was praying, the Lord brought me to a few scriptures that help explain the situations we know that the Spirit will bring to remembrance whatsoever he's told you. That's pretty much what was happening today in my prayer. Here's a story about a boat. John 6, 17 through 21. And entered into a ship, this is the disciples, and entered into a ship and went over the sea toward Capernaum. And it was now dark, and Jesus was not come to them. And the sea arose by reason of a great wind that blew So when they had rowed about five and twenty or thirty furlongs, they see Jesus walking on the sea and drawing nigh into the ship, and they were afraid. But he saith unto them, It's it's I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at land, whither they went. Now notice that they were going to go over to Capernaum, just like the Lord had told them, let's go over the other side. And it was dark. There was no light. Jesus wasn't there. They couldn't see him. He was not in this. Jesus was not in this situation. And they were fighting. Here comes a sea that, you know, it says the doldrums cause squalls or hurricanes even. By reason of a great wind that blew. So they were rowing in their flesh. They were rowing in their flesh. And finally, they were probably getting tired. They went 20 or 35, 30 furlongs. Then... After struggling, they see Jesus. He's coming close, and it scared them. But he saith unto them, It's I, be not afraid. Then they willingly received him into the ship. You notice that before they willingly received him, they were afraid, which means they did not willingly receive him. The disciples did not willingly receive him in the ship. It's funny how a boat is mentioned in the scripture. You know, in this case, the disciples were fighting the wind. You know, and when I when I normally think of the doldrums, I think of the no wind at all part because that's where I'm at right now, and that's how I usually just that's how I usually think of it. But the actual definition that I read in Wikipedia is that the doldrums can also also produce squalls, very much like the scripture says right here. And what was being impressed upon me during this prayer was the fact that they were rowing in their own strength. You know how God seems to highlight something to you. Like if you want to talk to a person, it's like a mouse pointer's over their head, or they begin to glow, and then you know what I mean. It's just, it's just like, hey, pay attention to this part. The fact that they were rowing in their own strength was what was getting to me. It was wrong. They weren't trusting in God. They weren't willingly receiving Him. You know, there's something about rowing in our own strength. Then the fact that when they saw Jesus. Which could mean, you know, finding Jesus' true purpose for their lives. Where were they going in this boat? What was the compass heading? You know? How many times has the Lord talked to you and given you instructions and you're afraid to follow through with them? How many times have you stopped praying because you didn't like 
what the Lord was saying in prayer. You know, in Acts somewhere it says, show Paul these things that he must suffer for me. You know, we must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. And we as Christians need to understand these things. You know, we've got to be overcomers. But while we do those things, we're not going to get where we need to go. It's only when we let Jesus in the boat that we can get to the other side. Now, notice that when they received Jesus into the ship, that they were immediately at the other side. They were immediately at the other side. Let me reread that verse. In John 6:21, it says, Then they willingly received him into the ship, and immediately the ship was at the land. Now, isn't that awesome? They were immediately at the other side of the suit. They've been rowing for hours. Heck, I don't know, days? I don't know. But they've been rowing 25, 30 thir- furlongs. And then when they let Jesus in, they're immediately at the land. Friends, isn't that what you want? Don't you want Jesus in your boat? Don't you want to immediately get to the other side of the storm? Then as I was praying this through, you know, the scripture that we know, Zechariah 4, 6, B, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. We can struggle in our might. We can use all of our power, all of our resources, but only the spirit of God gets things done. Money cannot cure cancer. You know, I keep thinking of my dad. You know, I lost him. Not power, not the most powerful man on earth. And the biggest army in the world can cure all kinds of cancer. But I've seen prayers where the Spirit of God has healed people that were supposed to die from cancer. It was the Spirit of God. It wasn't might. It wasn't money. So it sounds like we actually need to submit to God. When we're in the doldrums, could it be that we're fighting in the flesh? We're not going anywhere. We're not listening to God. Isn't there there something wrong? What what in this equation do we need to do? In submitting to God, you know, I'm going to go to James 4, 7, of course, but it means to come under the mission of God, submission. Okay, we need to come under his plan, not our own plan. What is his perfect plan for our life? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he'll flee. So when we're submitting, when we're coming under the mission of God, the devil eventually gives up. But if we don't submit to God... The squalls and the doldrums, they may just continue until we finally get around to submitting. So, during this time of no wind in my sails, as I prayed today, Isaiah 40, 31, which I've been hearing a lot, actually. (laughs) But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. And they shall walk and not faint. Now, it's those that wait upon the Lord, not those that don't wait upon the Lord. And then, when we do, there's going to be this moment that comes, and we will, we will rise up. We will mount up with wings. Eagles fly much better with wind underneath their wings. Then we'll, have the, we'll have the energy to run, and we won't get tired because we will know that that word of God and that spirit of faith is just blowing our sails towards that compass heading that he wants us to be on. In the doldrums of either squalls or calm seas where we can't get anywhere, it's a good idea to wait upon the Lord. And as I was praying, you know, I was envisioning things, and I was like looking at myself on this boat, this sailboat, in this quiet, calm sea, where I've been there for weeks with nothing, not moving at all. And on this boat, there was no internet, there was no television, but I had my Bible, and I had my guitar. So all I did while my boat wasn't moving, I sought Jesus, and I worshipped. Eventually, God will show up and get into the boat. I know this. And I will let his spirit fuel me and take me to the other side. As I continue to pray this through, I mean, this was, you know, guys, when you pray, you know, we're, you're supposed to close your eyes or, or look in the Spirit. You know, be watchful under prayer. How many scriptures say that, right? Listen for the Lord. So this was a, a give and take. It was a communication. And as I continued to pray, I was taken to the place in Acts where Paul was, he was faunching at the bits to do the Lord's will. But he just had no idea what to do. 
I mean, this is kind of it's kind of obvious in the passage that I'm about to read here that Paul was a little bit he was a little bit frustrated because the Spirit actually was prohibiting him from him from doing something, from preaching the word. Can you imagine that? I'm about to read it. So here's the scripture in Acts 16, six through twelve. Now, when they had gone throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia, after they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. And they, passing by Mysia, came down to Troas. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man from Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, immediately... We endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Therefore, loosing from Troas, we came with a straight course to Samothracia, and the next day to Neapolis, and from thence to Philippi, which is the chief city of that part of Macedonia, and a colony, and we were in that city abiding certain days. So notice how the Spirit of God was forbid, forbidding Paul to preach the word. So now, preaching the word obviously is good and acceptable, but in this case, it's not perfect. It's not the perfect will of God. God had other plans for Paul. But it does sound strange. Now think about it. Think about it. It sounds kind of strange that the Spirit of God prohibited an apostle of Jesus Christ from preaching the, pos- the, the, the gospel, from preaching the word. Now, doesn't that sound strange? I mean, Lord, don't you want me to preach the word? Then Paul was trying to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered him not. So, Paul, an apostle of Jesus, was somehow, we can perceive, he was fighting the will of God somehow. And I wonder why. How did Paul get into this state of mind? Could it be that maybe he wasn't praying enough? Maybe he wasn't waiting on the Lord enough? Maybe he didn't like what he was hearing in prayer? I mean, we've got to to go to the Lord in prayer and say, what is up? Why was Paul trying to do? He was trying to preach to people, but he was prohibited from doing so by the Spirit of God. Now, I think, you know, there's a vision. It says a vision appeared to him at night. Now, this could possibly be a vision during prayer, but maybe it was a dream. Maybe maybe Paul was having a problem in his prayer life. The reason I say that, I'm about to move to a point here, because I'm speculating that Paul finally finally gave in and submitted to God in a prayer. He said, okay, I'm submitting. Give me your will, Lord. Or maybe it took God a dream to give it to him. One clue that gives me the speculation is the scripture says, a man from Macedonia, asked him to come. Notice it was a man, the male gender. Now, we know that Paul, from the scriptures, he was big into not letting women teach and stuff like that. But if you follow the rest of this story, (laughs) he he baptizes a woman. So, and then later on, in Galatians, we see that he writes, for you're all children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you have been baptized in Christ, have put on Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you're all one in Christ Jesus. So I'm just wondering, you know, I'm wondering how he was fighting God in that passage, and it finally took this miraculous event to put some wind in his sails. And to notice that he immediately got on board with the will of God, and they immediately, they quickly made it to their destination. So if this is you, and you're having a hard time in the doldrums, let's, let's remember that we need to wait upon God. You know, we need to wait upon God, seek God, worship God, not go about doing things in our flesh, even the good and acceptable things. We want to do the perfect things. We want to do the perfect will of God. And that takes the Spirit of God. I'm going to read one last scripture here. And I'm going to show you another example of waiting on God. And I think this is the example of how we, in this millennium or decade or whatever, in this time, should be having church. This is how we should be having church. In Acts 13, 1 through 4, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon, that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manan, which had been brought up with Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. 
As they had ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed, they laid their hands on them, and they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. Now notice here that there are New Testament prophets. That's one thing I like to drive home. Oh yeah, check out my prophetic community on G+. I'll put a link in here somewhere. Uh, if you're into the prophetic, uh, there's a lot of eschatology over there, but I'm also into current prophecies, you know, dreams, stuff like that. It's a good thing to check out. It's the prophetic community on Google+. You'll love it. Now, there were prophets in that church, and as they had ministered to the Lord, in other words, they had put, they had submitted, they put their desires, they crucified their, their flesh, they carried their cross, they put their wills and desires far below, or crucified them entirely, far below the will of God. They became under the sub mission of God. And they were serious. They fasted. This church did not last an hour, and then they went to go see the football game. They didn't go to Luby's after this. They fasted, and they waited. They waited. They were in their doldrums, and they waited for Jesus to come to their boat. And then the Holy Ghost says, they waited for the Lord to speak. Then they rose up with wings as of eagles. They were fueled with the spirit of faith because they knew they had a word. Then the word says, separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work. This is the work that I want you to do. And when they had fasted and prayed some more, during this fasting and praying, they were probably getting confirmation. They were making sure, or they were probably basking in the faith that God was giving them for this mission that they were to submit to. Then they laid their hands on them and sent them away. Now, here's the next verse. So they being sent forth by the Holy Ghost. They weren't sent forth by their flesh. They weren't sent forth by their carnal reasoning. They were sent forth by the Holy Ghost. Friend, are you being sent forth by the Holy Ghost? Are you in a doldrums where you're not hearing from God? Well, we talk today about getting under the mission of God. Let me pray for you. Father God, I just pray for the listeners of this podcast. Lord, I pray that they are secure in their faith. Lord, I pray that the will that you have for them in their lives is without question. Lord, I pray for a measure of faith a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind is fueling their sails and is heading their boat, their ministry, on the compass heading that you have for them, Lord. I pray, Lord, for those that are in the doldrums right now, Lord, I pray that they know to wait until they're sure. They know to wait. And, Lord, I pray that you, you know, some of us complain about not hearing, Lord. I pray that they hear you. You can open the ears of the deaf. You can open the eyes of the blind. Do so now, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hopefully you enjoyed this. Hopefully you got something out of it. If you did, please consider giving an offering. I do have a, a PayPal. You can use Visa or PayPal on my sidebar at conradrocks.com or conradrocks.net. Um, just check it out. Um, I love you guys. Thank you for being in my life. Till we meet again, dig deeper, go higher. Hi, it's Conrad from ConradRocks.net. I talk about pretty much anything from a Christian point of view. Please take the time to check out my advertisers at ConradRocks.net and don't forget to subscribe via email. If you subscribe via email, not only will you get my updated blog posts, videos, and podcasts delivered directly to your email, you will also receive my Inner Circle newsletter, stuff I don't normally put on my blog real inner circle type stuff. You deserve it because you rock. You know, I've had many supernatural experiences since I was a small child. Things like astral projection, telekinesis, poltergeist, levitation, just to name a few. And naively, I thought that since the church was based on a supernatural book, that they would readily offer me supernatural answers to my supernatural questions. However, instead of answers, I received rejection. 
So I began a relentless quest for truth. And in my quest for truth, I sought answers from the New Age, from various religions, the Eastern religions, and I delved heavily into the paranormal sciences. Finally, one day on my journey, I encountered the truth. The truth opened my eyes to yet another supernatural dimension that few experience. In my book, Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey, I catalog many of my supernatural experiences. Now, while many books have been written on the soulish dimensions, I venture further and I talk about what it takes to see the kingdom of heaven. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey is available on Amazon in both paperback and Kindle. Open Your Eyes, My Supernatural Journey.